And thank you, Masood, for a very kind introduction. So goal of cognitive computing, I would like to assert, is to engineer the mind. And the cheapest and the fastest way, I would argue, to this goal is by reverse engineering the brain. So let my talk is essentially contained in this title. And let me just guide you through the details. So I was, this is really quite an honor to follow Horse, who just provided a perfect setup. He just left off exactly where I intend to begin. So you know, on May 11th, 1997, is when Deep Blue defeated Gary Kasparov. So as we reflect on this achievement, one wonders, what really is the goal? So one potential goal could be we would like to build intelligent business machines. <laughs> But, but why intelligent business machines? One could think, think about building inventive business machines or imaginative business machines or intuitive business machines. The point is that intelligence, imagination, intuition, language, perception, action, they're all forms and aspects of the mind. So the real goal, I argue, is to build mindful machines. That is the goal. Now. Give a, if you agree that that is the goal, then the question becomes, what is mind? Well, I have not been able to find a suitable definition or a specification for the mind. So some of my friends tell me that I must take up meditation to understand the mind. Now, since my Buddhahood is not coming, for now, mind, I take a working definition of mind as simply an intersection of three core cognitive phenomena. Perception, action, and cognition. The goal is to mechanize the mind so as to be able to mechanize the entire mind by means of a mathematical, computational, mechanistic theory. So this goal is actually not new. And the early AI pioneers very articulately captured the goal. So if we go back to the history of AI and look at one of the pioneers, uh, Professor Alan Newell from CMU, he said it very beautifully. What he said is that I mean a single set of mechanisms for all of cognitive behavior. A single set is the operative word here. Our ultimate goal is a unified theory of human cognition. What he's really saying is that when we look at mind, we don't really seek a piecemeal solution to synthesize the mind. In other words, we're not trying to build one algorithm for perception, another algorithm for action, some other algorithm for language, and then try at, a, at the back end to piece them together. We really like a unified, completely universal, single mechanism. And this this idea was also echoed by John Anderson, who's one of the, another AI pioneers. He said that the most deeply rooted preconception guiding my theorizing is a belief in the unity of human cognition. That is that all the higher cognitive processes, such as memory, language, problem solving, imagery, etc., are different manifestations of the same underlying system. So, we are after a single mechanism to capture the entire mind. So how does one go about it? Well, the intuition is very beautifully captured by Patricia Churchland and Terry Sajnowski in their quote here. And it's really absolutely apropos. It would be convenient if we could understand the nature of cognition without understanding the nature of the brain itself. It would be convenient. Unfortunately, it is difficult, if not impossible, to theorize effectively on these matters in the absence of neurobiological constraints. So what they are saying, they agree to the goal that we would like a universal mechanism of cognition, but it seems that they're leading us back to the brain. And this was very beautifully captured by a National Geographic article, which put it very aptly. The mind is what the brain does. So we are really left in our quest to mechanize the mind, we are led to the brain. So plan A. What we do is we just walk over to the Society of Neuroscience meeting this uh, November in San Diego and catch the very first neuroscientist we find and tell them, 
please let me know how the brain works so that I can write a program and mechanize the mind. Well, unfortunately, John Searle points out the dirty secret of neuroscience, he says, is we do not have a unifying theoretical principle of neuroscience. In other words, we don't have a theory of how the brain works. We know a lot of facts about what actually goes on in the brain, but we do not have a unified theoretical account of how what goes on at the level of neurobiology enables brain to produce the mind. Okay? It's very, so in some sense, you know, the San Diego plan is not going to work. It's a good idea anyway, but that isn't going to work. So what do we do next? Well, if you look at the statement, there is a silver lining. He said that we know a lot of facts about what actually goes on in the brain. So the idea is that if we could collect, really, really as a humanity, as a civilization, if we collect all known facts about the brain, all the quantitative facts from electrophysiology, from neuroanatomy, um, uh, from cognitive neuroscience, and try to integrate and operationalize this knowledge, then perhaps we might have a shot at understanding the mind. So what I propose is let us just simulate the brain with, with, a, with a focus on understanding and mechanizing the mind. So on our path to simulating the brain, we need to understand just two basic concepts so that I can lead you through the results that we have, and these concepts are classical. Neuron, everybody has heard of the term. Discrete computational entities of the brain. And this term was coined in 1891 by one Waldeir Hartz. Uh, he actually also coined the term chromosome and then used his fame to coin neuron. There were comp several other computing proposals for this entity. Another term is a synapse, which is a junction between two neurons. So with respect to a synapse, the incoming neuron is known as the presynaptic neuron, and the outgoing neuron is known as the postsynaptic neuron. I would need the terminology for some of the computer scientists. So let me tell you, what is a very simple, essential structure of a cortical or a brain simulator? The idea is extremely simple. What we do is we take time, and we divide up time into small slices, let's say one millisecond, okay? Now, for every neuron and for every time step, you simply update the state of the neuron depending on the inputs that is received since last one millisecond has passed. And if updating the state of the neuron leads the neuron to fire, then you generate an event for each synapse that the neuron is postsynaptic to and presynaptic to. So in other words, neurons are simulated in a clock-driven fashion. And synapses, for every synapse, when it receives a pre- or a post-synaptic event, update its state, and if necessary, update the state of the post-synaptic neuron. So very, very simple idea. A cortical simulation by itself is not a very difficult program to understand conceptually. Of course, it's, uh, uh, as we'll find out, it's because of the problem requirements, the problem isn't very easy. So let's understand what does it really entail to put together a cortical simulator at a mammalian scale. So here are mice and men. So the mouse cortex, the two hemispheres of the mouse cortex, so this two is for the two hemisphere, each contain about 8 million neurons. So there are 16 million neurons in the mouse brain. Each neuron projects to about 8,000 different neurons. So it eight, makes 8,000 synapses. So there are about 128 billion synapses. In contrast, you know, human brain has about in two times you know, 100 billion, really, uh, neurons and 10 to the 15 synapses. Okay? Now, as one look at simulating so many neurons and so many synapses and try to make this into a computational problem, one has to analyze the problem from the three classic resources that any computational platform has to face, which are communication, computation, and memory. So let's look at that. So first, we look at communication. Okay? 
Let's assume that neurons fire on an average at 1 hertz. So if neurons fire on an average at 1 hertz, in other words, every neuron emits a spike once a second, then each neuron is connected to you know, 8,000 synapses, total of 128 billion synapses. So we, one must process 128 billion spikes per second in mouse and about 10 to the 15 spikes per second in humans. So that's communications. Now computation. So you know, already there is an assumption that I'm making. The assumption that they're making is that the neuronal state update equations and the synaptic state update equations are roughly similar. So under that assumption, the computation time, once again, is dominated by synapses. See, there's two times the number of synapses. The reason there is two is because of the each synapse must be updated twice, once when it's presynaptic neuron fires and once when it's postsynaptic neuron fires. So that's really the computation requirement here. And finally, the memory requirement, right? What is the state? Once again, the state requirement is dominated by the number of synapses. Okay? So really, the story of simulating cortex is not dominated by neurons, but by synapses. So we should have really not had neural networks, but synaptic networks would have been a more apropos name. So this really is what the problem demands. If one were to simulate a mouse brain at one millisecond resolution in near real time, this is what one must come up to. So here is a state-of-the-art supercomputer that we had access to. Just I want to match up. This is just an imaginary exercise. This is a Blue Gene L supercomputer at IBM Watson. It had about 8,192 CPUs comprising of a total of 45 teraflops of computation. Each CPU is capable of about one gigabyte per second in and out bandwidth, and has a total of four terabytes of memory. So we, you know, if you think about it for just a few minutes, you will realize that human scale is out of question even here, absolutely. But this can become possible if one makes certain Assumptions. For example, if one assumes that every spikes per second message right, can be processed in 66 byte per spike, right, then this would exactly match up to this, assuming neurons fire at 1 hertz. Okay? Let's make an assumption. It's in red, by the way. Now, if one makes an assumption that synaptic computation can be captured in 350 floating point operations per synapse per second, then this would add up to exactly 45 teraflops, which sounds very promising. Okay? And the memory, if one assumes that the synaptic state can be compressed down to just 32 bytes per synapse, you know, this includes all the transient memory, all the neuronal memory, everything. We just look only at synapses. Then this number also adds up. So, okay, so what I've shown you is just a theoretical promise that there exists a machine which seems more or less comparable under certain assumptions on neurons and synapses to the computational capacity of a mouse. But as anybody who has written programs for such machines and has done algorithmic engineering, to match this up is far from an easy task. It really, you know, it would make, you would really require, you know, top-notch computer science just to even try to bring about such a dream. Okay? So let me tell you where we are and what we are trying to do. So, the, so let's switch a little bit and start with Breitenberg and Schutz, the classic book on cortex and its geometry. Well, a mouse scale network would have 16 million neurons, as I said, 80% of which would be excitatory, and 20% of which would be inhibitory. It would make 8,000 synapses per neuron. Let's assume external conduction delays of 1 to 20 milliseconds. I mean, the book has about 1 to 17, but I think it doesn't really matter. And this is a very crucial variable, 0.09 local probability of connection. So this, is a, this comes about because of the morphology of the neurons. And you know, we can go into details if you like. But this is a very important number. So we, we try to construct a network of this scale with these parameters. Then we used phenomenological spiking neurons from Iskevich. There is also very nice work now from Brett and uh, Gerstner, Wolfram Gerstner, which proposed another family of phenomenological spiking neurons. So when you say phenomenological neurons, this means that the neurons themselves are not biologically 
realistic, but they produce biologically plausible behavior. And the neurons that Iskevich proposed just consist of two state variables, V and U. V stands for membrane potential, U for recovery variable. You don't have to really understand the equations to understand the result. Only one nonlinear quadratic terms and four variables, A, B, C, and D. So there are four parameters, A, B, C, and D. And by carefully choosing these parameters, one can obtain behavior of a wide variety of cortical neurons. For example, one can get, you know, uh, uh, excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons of different kinds, okay? And we use STTP, or spike timing dependent plasticity. You know, this rule was uncovered by Henry Markram and Birch Sackman in 1997. And also Professor Mu Ming Pu from Berkeley has done fundamental work. I mean, a lot of people have done fundamental work. We use phenomenological you know, STTP model from Song, Miller, and Abbott. And the idea, this is really a gem of computational neuroscience and of neuroscience. The idea is very simple. The idea is that with respect to a synapse, there's a presynaptic neuron I say and a postsynaptic neuron. The strength of the synapse is updated with respect to the relative timing of the pre- and the postsynaptic neurons firing. Okay? If the presynaptic neuron fires, and shortly thereafter, the postsynaptic neuron fires, then the postsynaptic neuron sort of thinks that the presynaptic neuron is somehow responsible for its firing and rewards the synapse. Okay? So synaptic rate is increased. But if the anti-causal behavior happens so that the postsynaptic neuron fires first, followed shortly by a presynaptic neuron, then the synapse is depressed, its weight is decreased. And so in some sense, this rule is a local algorithm to implement sort of Hebbian learning. So we implemented STTP. And we had, as I said, access to a blue gene uh, with 8,192 processors and four terabytes of memory. And what is the result? The result is, which the key result which we published in two short papers in COSINE conference this year and will also present at the CNS conference that's coming up in Toronto, is that we can simulate one second of model time, this model, in 10 seconds of real time at one hertz firing rate at one millisecond simulation resolution using random stimulus. Okay? So we are very, very close. So this, I think, is an unprecedented result in two ways. It combines extremely large cortical simulations along with extremely short turnaround times. So imagine sitting at you know, such a large supercomputer trying out different kinds of models, crazy ideas that you might have on you know, changing the parameters of SDTP, you know, putting in a model, and a few minutes later, getting a result back, you know, saying what happens on such a large-scale network, right? And you know, we have been able to run now thousands and thousands of simulations just to you know, understand the basic properties of the networks. So in some sense, I believe that this is a historic result. So it's a very proud movement. But it's also a very, very humbling movement for, many, for two reasons. One is that a mouse has 16 million neurons. A rat is about 3.5 times bigger brain than a mouse. Cat is about 10 times bigger than a rat. A monkey is about 10 times bigger brain than a cat. And a human is about 10 times bigger than a monkey. So although this is impressive as it is, we are at least a factor of 3,500 away from the human brain, even given the fact that we have used relatively simple neurons and relatively simple version of you know, spike timing dependent plasticity. So really, it really, the best days of supercomputing as applied to cortical simulation are ahead of us and not behind us. Okay? So if you're thinking about jumping into this field, you know, this is really the time. Next 20 years, we as a humanity will solve this puzzle. And it will require innovation from a number of different perspectives. And the second reason why this is also a humbling result is is think about the mouse brain. It has 16 million neurons, which are packed in just 1.6 square centimeter of cerebral cortex. Very tiny little area. 
You know, it doesn't have anywhere close to the power requirement that this machine might have. Although, I must say that this is one of the best power requirements, you know, per square foot and per dollar that we can buy, but still. So really, there is just enormous amount of, forget about, even for a minute, just impact on neuroscience and computational neuroscience. Just in terms of computer science, software and hardware innovations that are to come, this portends just really a really bright career for us, and we will have jobs, there's no doubt. <laughs> so, so, you know, the way I like to think about these cortical simulators is they are sort of the linear accelerators of computational neuroscience. So, with that, let's pause for a moment and go back to deeper history, to 1955 and 1956. This were actually very, very interesting years. What happened is that a team of researchers in 1955, 1956, I believe, ran an extremely large-scale cortical simulation of 512 neurons on IBM supercomputer then. And so we have come a long way. And this team was actually led by a guy by the name of Nathaniel Rochester. And Nathaniel Rochester, although he's a forgotten name, has a very deep place in history. The proposal that created you know, the art term artificial intelligence was authored by John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Cloud Shannon, and Nathaniel Rochester, who was manager of bioinformation processing at IBM in 1956. So this was, he was really ahead of his time and a great person anyway. So you know, when, when I tell people, some of the neuroscience friends of mine, that uh, we put together such large-scale simulations, they assume that by default, the simulations are just garbage and it's producing nonsense. Because there's a prevailing view that the simulations, you cannot even make them stable. So there are lots of uh, criticism, but I'll just give you one view. This, this goes back to 1990s. So this, but this is a view that for a large network of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and by large, he meant 1,000 neurons, with small you know, potentials, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to attain steady ongoing activity at low firing rates. In other words, it's hard to find stable networks when we try to synthesize such cortical networks, let alone infer from them property of the cortex. Okay? So indeed, this is true. So here's an example. Here, what you're seeing is in a, on a mouse scale, actually slightly larger simulation. This is the simulation time step on x-axis in milliseconds. So there, you know, it's a one second worth of simulation. What you see here is percentage of neurons that fired. And you see what happened is that Initially, the network got active, and that became absolutely stable. In other words, it died. <laughs> There's nothing. This network produced no activity whatsoever. So well, this makes you very pessimistic. Let's try something else. So you try other set of parameters. Again, this is simulation time step in milliseconds. And this is a percentage of neuron fires. Now see what's happening is the network got into an avalanche mode, and everything is fired. So as you begin to understand this network, you realize that really what governs cortical networks and their stability, their synchronization, their asynchronization, is the balance of power between the excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons as the simulations unfold through time. Okay? So really, that's the key issue. And sure enough, after a few months of work by my colleague, uh, he was able to find networks which are very stable. So here's one example. Again, simulation time step in millisecond. There's the percentage of neuron fired. And you can see that the percentage of neurons fired exhibit a very rhythmic pattern. So this is just one example. We can exhibit several examples of rhythmic or asynchronous stable patterns. So now this is not a low dimensional attractor state as it may look like. Okay? If, so here's a different view of the same graph. If you, again, the x-axis is simulation time step, and y-axis is the ID of the neuron on node 0. Remember, there are many, many, many nodes, so you can't display all of them. But this is you know, some thousand neurons displayed. And for neuron 200, let's say, if it fires at time 300, there'll be a dot there. Okay? So these are called the raster graphs. And if you look at the raster graphs and study them, and study the correlations, 
totally different neuron fire at different peaks. So in other words, it's not that the same neurons are firing, although the network itself is in a synchronous rhythm. The neurons themselves are not in a synchronous rhythm. Okay? There are many, many such properties that one can find and one can study. That's not where I want to focus my attention on. I want to just show you one little glimpse is that if you give specific stimuli to this network, for example, you know, take a smaller network, you know, stimulate you know, with an edge every half a second, you get very, very interesting behaviors in firing. Again, this is firing rate. And if you expand it, and if you study that, you know, sort of finer scale, you see very nice, you know, aperiodic bursty patterns. You can see beginning of sort of neural groups, chains, and we can we can really produce an entire zoo of results that we observe through our simulation. But that's not really what I want to focus on. Okay, really, I don't want you to think of this as the end. This is really the seed, not the tree. This is the start, not the end. Okay? So really, let us now realize the tool that we have and focus on where we are headed and why we are headed there. Okay? So as we focus on that, we can consider adding a wide variety of details to the simulator. But we are not in a rush to just integrate any piece of data that we can find from neuroscience and put it into the simulator. Because we have a goal, which is to synthesize the mind. And the theory is that somehow that is arising from the computational nature of the simulations from the brain. Right? So we are going to be very precise about what we add to the simulation with a view towards computation. I'm going to give you a, a list of things we can add, and then I'm going to focus on one particular thing that we are working on adding. Okay? So of course, you know, we can add you know, richer neuronal dynamics, multi-compartmental models. We can add richer synaptic dynamics, you know, like active dendrites and gain control. It turns out that when you begin to look at synaptic dynamics from a computational perspective, a totally different view emerges than what has been traditionally known. Synapt active dendrites have a way of completely changing the way of the, gra the graph of the neuronal computation as we think. And I, I will not be able to go into it today. And you know, different forms of STTP, Range of synaptic weights, balance of excitation and inhibition, you know, external and dendritic delays, corticothalamic and thalamocortical delays, all of these affect computation. And of course, eventually, strength, location, rate, and timing of stimulus, because that's what we are really after. Neuromodulators, for example, dopamine. But the thing I want to focus on and really spotlight today is neuronal interconnectivity and how it might offer the key going forward. Okay? So neuronal interconnectivity or neuroanatomy can be thought of, you know, really in words of Valentino Bradenburg, as pointing especially to the brain-like computers of the future. Okay? So we are actually going to take this statement verbatim and try to implement it. Okay? That's really the end goal here. So here's a beautiful graph uh, for picture from uh, Dr. Park. Uh, who shared it with us generously. So here what you're seeing is two lobes you know, of the brain. What the covering here is the cerebral cortex. It's a thin sheet, about two to three millimeter thick. And here you see the white matter tracks. Okay? So what it is is that neurons make connections with each other over short distances and also over long distances. So this is gray matter connectivity. Short distance connectivity is hidden in cortex. This is white matter connectivity, long distance connectivity. right? So we're going to study both of them very precisely. OK, so let's start with microanatomy. So microanatomy, or gray matter anatomy, or short distance connectivity is studied from a statistical perspective. I mean, imagine this. A cortex, you know, one square millimeter of cortex has about 100,000 neurons underneath it. So nobody really has tools today to precisely figure out the graph, although people have done you know, lots of advances. So the anatomy that is known is more or less statistical. But very, very good numbers are known. For example, there's a beautiful classic work from Binzegger, Douglas, and Martin, where they really collated years of studies on neuroanatomy on CAT area 17, which is visual cort visual, primary visual cortex area, and put it together into a graph. I'll explain it to you. What you're seeing here is a slice through the two-dimensional uh, cortical sheet. Okay? These are x and y thalamic efferents. This is layer 6, layer 5, layer 4, layer 2 and 3. They're often thought of together. Layer 1. These are 
the excitatory neurons, and these are the inhibitory neurons. Now, the size of the circle around each bullet here represents the relative number of neurons of a particular kind in a particular layer. So, you know, this circle right here represents, the area of the circle represents the number of excitatory neurons in layer 2 and 3, okay, and so forth. That's the idea. And each edge, obviously, denotes the number of synapses going on. 90% of all synapses are shown. And this really is a beautiful graph. And this graph can actually be encoded and simulated. And that's where we're going. Okay? So there are about 13% inhibitory neurons, 87 excitatory neurons. 77% you know, connection is from excitatory to excitatory, 10% from excitatory to inhibitory, 11% from inhibitory to excitatory, and 2% from inhibitory to inhibitory. So these, you know, one no longer needs to philosophize. I mean, one can still, but what I prefer is just take the data and try to study the emergent dynamics from this data. Okay? So we're just about putting this together. Now let's turn our attention to macroanatomy or white matter or long distance connectivity. Now, in contrast to the short distance connectivity, the long distance connectivity is quite specific. I mean, V1, for example, connects to V2 in a particular species. And this is not random. This is not statistical. So you must really integrate a lot of data. So the classic work on macroanatomy is you know, Vanessen and Feldman's visual hierarchy, where they took macaque monkey's uh, visual cortex and integrated large amount of data about the visual hierarchy. There is classical work by Deepak Pandya on the auditory cortex. But what has now emerged is a beautiful database called COCMAC, which is collation of connectivity data on the macaque brain, and you can see it on the internet. What we did is we downloaded the entire database, which consists of about 410 neuroanatomical papers on the white matter tracks, collected by Ralph Cotter and his colleagues. We just extracted you know, all of the data, and the data comes in two sort of flavors. Okay, so there are subset relationships. For example, you know. Uh, the temporal lobe is a subset of cerebral cortex, is a subset relationship example. And there are lots of inconsistent data points. So, you know, area A could be identical to area B, which is identical to area C, which is a substructure of area A. So there could be all sorts of, you know, messy data just in the literature itself that we have to algorithmically clean up. But we found about 20,000 such data points. And there is connectivity. For example, V1 connects to V2, or thalamus projects onto, you know, certain areas of the cortex. So here's a visual demonstration of this graph. This is actually real. We have it. So sort of you think of this as the core node and think of sort of a tree. It's best if I perhaps use my cluster cursor here. So that's the brain. The brain has two subsets, forebrain and the midbrain. The midbrain has sort of tectum. Tectum is pretectum, you know, inferior colliculus, superior colliculus, right? And if you go to the forebrain, forebrain, I can't see very well here, but has a, you know, telencephalon, which has cerebral cortex, and uh, also has, I think, uh, basal ganglia. If you go into basal ganglia, it's amygdala, claustrum. Items. So, and now if you go to cerebral cortex, you can find occipital okay, lobe, so forth. Okay, so we have essentially, you know, data about brain and its substructures, you know, thousands of areas. Okay, and what is more interesting, of course, is that we have the connectivity graph. So we know how is that connected? So this is how a computer scientist would like to see neuroanatomy. Give me a graph. Once you give me a graph, I can simulate it, I can mine it, I can understand it. Right? And of course, you know, this could become also a very nice tool to study and teach neuroanatomy. So for example, one can, you know, pick up one particular thing and study connections that are going, you know, incident on it. Or, you know, you can go to anywhere. I mean, it just doesn't matter, really. And just click. 
away. So you know, that's really one click away, the entire connectivity. And it's available to us in form of a neuroanatomical graph that we can simulate. Of course, this data is really, really, you know, it is wonderful. And it is going to be, it is going to be of a uh, lot of interest. But still, the data doesn't have the spatial resolution that one would need going forward. One really still needs to innovate. Okay, this is this is just a start. It'll just begin to tell us how these graphs are. You know, we we really studied this whole graph, and we found that the graph have a large portion of re recurrent connectivity. So if area A projects to area B with about probably 36 percent, uh, area B projects back to area A. So there's a lot of recurrent connectivity. And the structure of the graph is exactly a small world network. Okay? And this has been known. Olaf Sporns, for example, has done this, but on much smaller matrices than these matrices. These are about 10 times bigger matrices. But anyway, to, to break through the barrier of the spatial resolution that's limiting the white matter connectivity, you know, one must innovate. Right? That's the whole idea. And what we decided to do is to send one of our neurologically normal and psychologically questionable group member <laughs> to Stanford. Uh, this member actually was me. <laughs> and using the latest you know, diffusion tensor imaging techniques, I got my brain scan. And this data is really courtesy of a very brilliant graduate student, Anthony Sherbondi, at Stanford in collaboration with the postdoc Robert Dougherty there in Brian Wendell's lab at Stanford. So they really were courteous to do this. And what you really see here What you really see is a whole bunch of data points on the surface of my cortex. And what we have on top of this is connectivity between these data points. So this data has potential to guide future of simulations to the extent that we can combine this data with the COCOMAC data that I you know, described before or other MRI studies. Because you also need labeling of the data. See, just rot data may not be sufficient by itself. But really, I, again, I urge you to look at this as a potential. You know, and to do this right is going to take time. Okay? This, is, this is not done. So anyway, as I begin to really conclude, I would like to sort of put together a whole vision. Where are we really going? Where is this headed? Okay? So vision is to try to put together neurons neurons and synapses from rats and also microcircuit from cats okay macrocircuit white matter connectivity from monkeys and humans like you and me at a scale of mouse so we're really inbreeding here very very across species on blue gene <laughs> what do you think will happen I think this is what will happen. <laughs> so you know, whether we'll find mine or not, we'll, we'll have fun. And this is, you know, we'll try to put it together in as, you know, as, as computer science-y a way as possible to you know, get as quickly as possible to applications. And you know, as I conclude the talk, I would really like to you know, thank uh, the members of my group, you know, the, and please rise up uh, so that people know who you are. So, uh, Dr. Raj Gopal Anant Narayan and James Fry. So these two people are sort of the, you know, the engine behind uh, our blue gene optimization. Don't try to hire them away. Dr. Anthony and Durango. Anthony, uh, yeah, okay. Anthony is a string series, as you can tell from his uh, look. <laughs> Uh, he is, uh, he's been studying what is a, the question of what is a minimal embodiment that one must build in order to put brain out into the real world. And he's also studying uh, dynamics of large scale cortical networks. And Dr. Raghav Singh, Raghav, are you here? Uh, and Safir Hujati. OK, so Raghav and Safir are leading the charge on uh, COCOMAC and macroanatomy. And also, you, know, you might have realized that this is somewhat of an ambitious project. And one really cannot put together such projects 
without real harmony and interaction with executive management. Okay? You just cannot, you know, Horst talked about how really days of single PI are over, also days of just dreaming up things and hoping the world will catch on are over. And you know, we are really blessed at Almaden to have really visionary people. So I would like to thank you know, the people who really are the wind behind this whole enterprise. You know, Dr. Mark Dean, who's the vice president of Almaden. Dr. Moeddin Moyuddin, who's the associate director of Almaden. Is Moeddin here? So he, he's going to make it. He's probably lost. Dr. Dilip Kanlur, he's the head of storage. Dr. Laura Haas, she's head of software. Dr. Jim Sforer, head of services. And Dr. Gian Luca Bona, head of science and technology. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And let us begin the journey of integrating and operationalizing neuroscience so as to synthesize psychology, mind, behavior, and create new applications which really the world is seeking. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for questions. And please introduce yourself. Michael. Michael Abu. Uh, I hate to throw a bucket of cold water. Please, please, please do, Michael. Uh, you started with this idea that there's going to be a nice, uh, thank you. You started with the idea there's going to be this unified theory of cognition that's Correct. going to guide us. Correct. I think that's totally wrong. Uh, I, I think it's comparable to saying, well, once computer science realizes you can code things using bits, and it's very cru crucial to have conditional uh, instructions uh, as well as processing instructions, you've got the secret of computer science. That's true. That is the unifying principle for computer science. But as if you look at the size of computer science departments today, you see there are so many problems to be addressed. And I think what's going to happen is, is that, yes, putting lots of synapses together, understanding the, the anatomy of the brain are all crucial things, and I salute what you've achieved with your project. But I, I, I don't think it's begun to scratch the surface of what makes a cognitive system, and I think what makes a cognitive system will be a whole range of secrets that have evolved over millions of years of the brain and over millennia uh, of human development. And it's going to be understanding how we can create a framework to orchestrate all those diverse understandings that's going to, in the end, yield the secret of cognitive computing. And it won't be the secret. It will be lots and lots of secrets that we will, of course, share with each other. Thank so you. I, I don't know where is the contradiction, because all I'm saying is that one must begin to integrate a large amount of data into a single framework. And from that single framework, which itself may consist of heterogeneous neuroscientific data, will arise a whole range of cognitive phenomena. I do not subscribe to the view that one needs to invent a different system for vision, a different system for audition, or a different system for motor action. So all I'm saying is that the emergent behavior should then give rise to cognitive phenomena. But the platform itself will integrate a variety of heterogeneous features, as you say. And we have to orchestrate and integrate them. So now, so I, I don't see where the contradiction is. Go ahead, uh, Professor Shepard. I, I just had one, one quick question um, on the, the, uh, the picture you Head of the of your cortex lighting up. Yes. I, I I didn't quite get what the little oh, okay. green dots represented or okay. what they were. So so what what diffusion tensor imaging does is that it allows you to trace white matter pathways through the cortex. Okay. So the green dots were generally the ends of the pathways where the connectivity between the paths was not shown. Okay. So those are the endpoints. So you would kind of begin to simulate those points and use connectivity across them and use the length of the connectivity to derive external delays. That was the idea. Hi, uh, my name's Jed Donnelly. I actually work at NERSC. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, randomness. That, uh, I, I didn't About randomness, that one of the things about our computers is they're deterministic. And if you look, for example, the history of life on Earth, you see that there's you know, been this natural selection process of, quote, random mutations over millions of years. And one of the possibilities for creati creativity in brains is that uh, quantum mechanical microscopic random processes on a very massive scale can be selected 
uh, for, and I don't see how that's going to come out of. Oh, it, it's going to come out because the thing is, one would begin. One, see, I didn't address. Uh, I, I talked about the mind. I talked about the brain. I didn't address the link going back from brain again to the mind. I mean, that would be a different, you know, that would be a different exposition, and that would really come around. Um, from what's called you know, Hebbian cell assemblies or you know, neuronal group selection. So groups of neurons would then hopefully represent concepts or motor movements and so forth. And these groups themselves would be redundant. And they would also form multiple connections sort of in and out. So, you know, so that would allow for both your randomness and for also you know, multiple connectivity. I mean, sort of. So when you say randomness, do you mean non-deterministic? No, what do you mean by randomness? I mean, I'm trying to answer your question. What I mean by randomness is quantum mechanical randomness. Oh, that no. Is, this is, so the simulation here is really at a level of, you know, it's almost, you know, it, it's at a cellular level, right, at, at best. It's not really even at a cellular level. So what you're talking about, quantum mechanical effects will begin to play at a subcellular level. And this simulation and this effort is not really, you know, designed at all to address that. And, that that's, and that's what concerns me because if, if the the basis of the creativity is is with life is the random processes on a, on a very large scale, and and the brain selects from those random processes, then we aren't going to be able to capture it with a. Look, I, I'm an optimist, not a pessimist. And if you really take that view, you know, when we are not burning up the cycles on our blue gene, the people who do protein folding are. And really, we don't understand protein folding. Okay. So if you don't understand how single proteins fold over a short interval of time, to put together, even, even to put together a simulation or even a thought of a simulation to you know, combine those proteins or go below that, which is what you're referring to, I think is not the call of the day. I don't think that can be done, even if that were the case. So by necessity, you know, just the sheer necessity of the knowledge that's available to us from neuroscience and just the computational resources that exist. Uh, I'm Martin Rehn, I'm from Berkeley. If I understand you correctly, you want to find sort of cognitive elements or computational elements that form the unified uh, algorithm of the brain. And my question is, how are you going to find that in your model? Are you going to put in algorithmic elements no. in addition to anatomy? No. Or it will all be emergent from this huge... Well, there is, there is this debate about top-down versus bottom-up, right? So if I took a specific algorithm and tried to program it in, then the whole enterprise is lost, right? Okay. Then may as well just do it on a, in, on, on a platform that can do that the best. So the idea really is we are searching, and you know, as you begin to play with this network, sort of, you know, strange sort of an intuition, you know, sort of a zen-like feeling about what they're doing emerges, which you know, I and my colleagues share. We really are not at that level where I can quantify it and share it with you, but the idea is that f by studying the emergent dynamics of these networks, would be able to understand their information processing capacity and their operations. And hopefully then, once you understand the essence, you no longer need this framework, perhaps. Or maybe you do. I don't know. So do you have a specific methodology for I, I don't. I think there are other things? questions. I don't. So okay. I don't. OK. I, this, <laughs> I'm not going to impose a top-down theory. No, that, that's not a question. But for the emergent part, so we looked at plots. Well, how, how emergent emerges, right? If I impose on it. <laughs> OK. Lloyd? OK. Thank you. Um, if I may, uh, I th actually, I think there is a way to address the question about randomness that was Go just ahead, asked. In, in which? Oh, yes. My name is Lloyd Watts. I'm uh, uh, the CTO and uh, founder of Audience Incorporated. Um, the reason I wanted to address this is because, uh, in fact, I think there's a way that both of your points of view can be reconciled. Um, I, in the mid-90s, I did a lot of work on um, simulating large networks of event-driven event spiking neurons. And with a completely deterministic network, you can absolutely get random properties. Um, you don't have to rely on quantum mechanical assumptions or even a uh, random number generator inside the neuron simply by the, um, if you have a tonic firing rate, so that they're, they're spontaneously firing, but there's a si significant complexity in the interactions between the networks, you can get effectively random firing of the collection of neurons. Um, and I if you'd like, I could actually show you those things. So depending on the topology of the network, you can get bursting spiking behavior, as you showed. I don't think that was his question. No, I, I know. Um, you can get what you, are, what you are showing in one network topology, where you get lots of spiking burst patterns, 
in other network topologies, you can get random, uh, random behaviors that can be the, the basis for the, um, the, the spontaneous randomness of, that, that you were suggesting may be creativity. Anyway, I, I think there is a way for the deterministic network in order to achieve mm -hmm. the randomness behavior that you were asking about. I'd be happy to follow up on that if you want to see the results. Back. Um, Dave Knoll from the University of California, Merced. Um, my question has to do with the fact that the, the brain, even in a rat, doesn't spring from whole cloth uh, at birth. It's not right. mature, and there's a developmental process that's going to shape not only those myriad of synaptic connections, but also gross anatomical uh, patterns of connectivity. And I wonder how you're going to face the computational challenges of development, the computational challenges of providing a developmental environment for... Well, you know, just wait till the panel tomorrow. I think there is uh, one presentation there that will address some of that. And, uh, um, but I, I agree with you. I mean, if it is that our genes, really the whole network is programmed in, and the idea is just to figure out you know, uh, what the program is, uh, that would be very hard to address with this program of research. Really, the only thing we can address is, um, is really what can be done with plasticity and with anatomy and all the other myriad of facts that I mentioned. So I mean, see, obviously in the direction that I'm presenting, there's already a hypothesis as to what the solution might be. And if that solution is not correct, we will not find the answer. And you know, that, that, is, that is a given. So, thanks. Yeah. One last question. Ah. Hello, my name is uh, John Deneen. I'm associated with Doug Inc. Bart at the uh, Bootstrap Institute. Um, I think your presentation, uh, there would be a lot of value to consider uh, the advancement and breakthroughs of uh, biotechnology. And what I'm thinking in terms of uh, cognitive computing by potentially looking at uh, drug enhancement uh, versus AI. Uh, society may be already involved in, in major drug advancement. And um, I know that the military is very concerned about this uh, augmenting the human intellect of, of people rather than machines. Any comments? No, I think it's gone. I, I, thanks for sharing that. Okay. So, 